Hello, good evening, good day, good afternoon, good morning, wherever you are in the world. And welcome to the Black Belt Academy of Surgical Skills. My name is David O'Regan. I'm a cardiac surgeon in Yorkshire in the United Kingdom. I'm the director of the Faculty of Surgical Trainers for the Royal College of Surgeons of Edinburgh, and I'm a visiting professor at Imperial College London. Thank you very much to the 3,054 followers. If you're watching this evening, thank you, and I'm grateful you've returned. For those who are joining the first time, welcome, and I hope the series makes sense and you continue to follow. I'd like to thank all the viewers from Siena, Tripoli, Moscow, Baghdad, Glasgow, Liverpool, right across the globe. I'm truly grateful. This evening we're talking about synchronization and in my ION series I'm drawing on philosophies and this is from the Book of Five Rings by Miyamoto Mashashi, an undefeated samurai warrior from 1643. In all fields of endeavour there are things to learn. To act is called realising potential and function. Potential means to be thinking attentively of everything. Therefore, when that intently thought potential becomes stiff and frozen and hard, then you're entangled by potential and thus are not free. Potential is mental energy. The mind is inside and mental energy is the entrance. Mental energy is at the door, working outside for its master, the mind. The mind turns along with myriad of situations and its turning point is truly recondite. In the context of martial arts, myriad conditions means all the actions of adversaries. The mind turns with each and every action. For example, when the opponent raises his sword, your mind turns to the sword. If he whirls to the right, your mind turns to the right, and if he whirls to the left, your mind turns to the left. And this is called turning with myriad of situations. To be recondite is to be subtle and imperceptible. This means the mind is not lingering in any particular point, and if your mind stops or strays anywhere, you will be defeated in martial arts. If you linger where you turn, you will be crushed. Now I thought of that, and I think of assisting. And we all appreciate as surgeons what a good assistant does. It helps the flow and rhythm of an operation. But sadly, we do not teach the principles. So the Black Belt Academy is here to teach you some of the principles and demonstrate some models. Because I can't do my job without an assistant. And that is rule number one. So the first thing is an assistant. Going back to when I was a lad, these annuals, the look and learn, I received at Christmas every year. And this one I received when I was 15. And my son, 15, is joining me this evening. Thank you, Alistair. The other important thing is you go into theatre and you're looking and learning. Be aware of even the smallest things. And the best question you can ask in theatre is, please tell me why you did that. Shows interest and invites commentary from the surgeon. And I'd recommend that this is the most powerful question you can use as a student or learner in theatre. Please tell me why. And I recall when I was a registrar with John Pepper at the Brompton Hospital, and I just started there, and he was putting in a homograft. Uh, a stentless valve. And as he's putting in, I asked, please could you explain the orientation of this valve? Because to me it looked confusing and certainly it appeared it was going in wrong. Yes, 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 was the reply. Twenty minutes later, as they're stitching it in, he said to me, I now understand why you asked that question. And of course, the orientation of the valve was completely wrong. We had to take it out and start again. But it's a simple question, please tell me why. So in order to show you how we work, Alistair and I in martial arts are going through key on drills. And the key on drills 
are replying to punches and kicks with a coordinated and orchestrated synchronized set of movements. Although this is stylized and synchronized, we're rehearsing it such that in real combat, these are rehearsed and well practiced. So to demonstrate the synchronization, we've got, and we've tried it before, an elastic between us, and we're going to narrow the distance between the bands. So the first point of call is, is that if I step to the right, our shoulders need to be parallel all the time. If I step to the left, Alistair needs to step to the left as well, because we should be parallel shoulders and hips at all times, such that when he's operating in his half, his hands are not coming across in my half. So if I move around, and you move around as well. So there's a midline always between us as we are operating. And we're going to keep this on as we're demonstrating some skills to reinforce the fact. The other important thing is, is that as an assistant, never, or surgeon, never cross your hands. I know they teach that in piano playing, but there are pieces where you have to cross your hands to get music. But in surgery and assisting, please do not cross the midline and cross your hands. If that happens, you swap your tools over to ensure that you get full movement and full function. So I'm going to, we're going to come overhead and we're going to demonstrate the first of our models. And I'm going to move the camera. So bear with us one moment, please. So, so I'm on this side of the table, and this is that side, and I'm just trying to get the camera at a good angle for you, and I think it's going to be at a turned angle, but at least you can see. Now this is the model that I used last week for triangulation, and I was thinking to myself, actually for triangulation you need to hold three corners. So, Valister, pick up a forcep, please, you two, and that forcep as well. And you pick up that corner, please. And pick up that corner. And I pick up this corner. And in essence, you can see, if I was going to stitch along the blue line, or cut along the red line, I need to have these all triangulated in forces. And it would be very difficult for me as a single surgeon to do that and that's why you need four hands because my dominant hand here will be the stitching or cutting but I need one two three hands for triangulation and to operate by yourself makes it extremely difficult but very often the triangulation comes for example from a suture so I'm holding a suture out there at that point and that is providing triangulation as well. So if I hold on this side, I can stitch towards myself and just to point out two important things. Hold please Alistair. And you can see that Alistair is holding the suture between finger and thumb in the direction it has come out. He's also holding it two-fifths such that I've got three-fifths of suture material here where I can effect a stitch, but I'm not tripping over my suture. Now, the important thing is you always stitch towards yourself. So if I was stitching along this line, blue line, keep the tension, please, Alistair, and he holds the tension in that direction, let go, and I take it up, and I take it up in the direction that I want the tension, and I hold the tension there, and Alistair's job is to hold the tension. So even if I'm having a conversation with him, at no point in time do I want to see that tension actually dropped or lost. Now if I turn it round, let go, and I turn it round the other direction, and automatically, intuitively already, Alistair's picked up and triangulated. 
Hold that out, please, Alistair. There you go. Finger and thumb in direction, and I can stitch now towards me along the black line. There. There you go. And with practice, I would not need to say let go. But I hope you can see what Alistair automatically did. was moved his hands and moved the instrument across to his other hand while he followed with the right hand. So if I turned it round again, let go please Alistair, and held it up the other direction, there you go, without asking, Alistair's immediately put the forceps in the opposite hand and is maintaining tension. So if I move to the right, you see Alistair moves to the right, and if I move to the left, Alistair moves to the left. So our midline is kept in between us at all stages. Now, this is, becomes very important when operating and following and assisting. And I'll demonstrate this on the, the model that we previously used of our banana. And the plate with these bits of tape on are here to give you an idea of the vectors in direction. So when stitching, and I'm going to follow stitch and Alistair is going to follow, just follow please, just hold it out. I am going to start here because I want to demonstrate something important. I'm going to start, I'm at six o'clock, remember we always go to the clock, and I'm going to take a stitch through Six o'clock. Let go. Follow, please. The side. And you turn around so you can come round. Okay. So I'm stitching. Keep the tension, please, on. Keep the tension on the suture. And let go. Right. I'm coming round again. And Alistair's moving around further. So he's not reaching across the midline. But now I'm in a position where I'm thinking, ah, I'm about to stitch into my shoulder or into my dominant hand. And the only way I can get around that, I can might get it in now. Yeah, I can get it stitch in. But I certainly would not be able to do the next stitch. And the next stitch means... I now have to move backhand. So I'm moving backhand and immediately Alistair picks up the suture from the other direction. And I can continue my stitch in the backhand direction. Could you take the loop out? No, that's, don't reach me. That's fine. Thank you. And you can see on the banana, if you pull too tight, it'll cheese wire and you'll end up perhaps with a skid mark in the banana as it comes out. But I'm taking it out along the vector each time. Now we can make this model a little bit more challenging for Alistair because now we're going to do the same again. And I'm going to put my banana model with a traction element to it. And I'll just show you what I've done. I've put staples at each point. So as I stitch now, I'm wanting Alistair to follow, but also hold opposite me all the time to maintain that triangulation and stitching. I'm just going to start another stitch here. Okay, I'm still moving to my right. And I've got a hole in the stitch. And Alistair is moved as well, so we can keep the midline between us. So please follow. All right, well done. So I am going to be starting here 
and I'm going to hold the staple this side. And in a couple of lessons, Alistair's already remembered to hold opposite me. And the staple in the banana is quite a good exercise to practice with, because as you're stitching, the focus is on the stitching hand, and very often people forget that the non-dominant hand ends up dragging and drifting. And the potential is there to pull the stable out. And as I pick up another one, almost diagonally opposite, on the clock, Alistair again has picked up that stable, staple and is maintaining the stick tension for me. And this is important because it stabilizes all the tissues. And I'm now having to go to backhand and automatically Alistair's now moved his forceps to the opposite hand so he's not reaching across his body and I'm now picking up another staple and Alistair's maintaining the tension opposite. So, simple rules and a very short lesson. Anster now is making intuitive movements and his mind, his mental function, is realizing his potential as the assistant. So, as I continue around, you can see that the, the tape between us is moving and we're effectively keeping the midline all the time. So I'm going to jump a few. There you go. And the tape has moved again and I'm holding Okay, that would be about right, Alistair. That'll help. Well done. And with that direction, Alistair is actually assisting very well by holding the staple in the direction. So this is at 11 o'clock. This is opposite the forehand, backhand swap axis, I call it. And I need to continue forehand. And I'm going to move direction. And without, and Alistair, what you need to do? There you go, well done. The swap hands, keep the tension. And in swapping hands, Alistair has swapped his forceps over. Fairly straightforward. He's certainly looking at keep that tension and note that his fingers are holding the suture such that if it pulls out, pull out, pull the suture from me, there's no catch and it doesn't tear. And the thing about this banana model and practicing with an assistant, if it catches, that proline will tear out. So there you go. And I hope you can appreciate the dynamic as we're moving around the table, making this work. So what does it mean when we come to dissection? And again, this triangulation is important. So here I've got a piece of chicken and I'm wanting to dissect off this large flap of chicken here. And you can appreciate like I need to be able to hold it out. So this is where your assistant takes two forceps and you hold that out and hold it under tension, please. Uh, either side, one that side and one that side as well. And you're holding it up, pull it up taut and that towards you, please. And that enables me to then come down and keep pulling it, keep the tension there very good. So now my forceps is pr providing tension, but the tension across the whole of this flap is provided by my assistant, keeping these spread apart and lifting it up. A 
and a good assistant will automatically, if I change direction, move the forceps to there, that one, to that bit, because I'm going to be cutting there, and will keep the exposure going for me, enabling me to move and focus on that section without having to change and direct where we're holding. So now you can hold it closer, closer down now, there, hold there please. Okay, all right, you can move that one down there. So this comes with intuition and practice and understanding that the assistant is helping you with maintaining the dissection and enabling you to find the planes. So you can creep further down and hold it, and hold it there please, and with practice, and there you go. You can see how much easier an operation is when you, your assistant is holding tissues and literally is falling away and helping me identify and find planes. That was excellent. So the next important th function, and as you'll note, bring your forceps in now, that we talked about forceps before and how to hold them. You've got to be adept as an assistant to holding your forceps in your right hand and your left hand. So the next thing you've got to learn as the assistant is how to use your scissors. And I've got here a put of proline that I've tied to a coat hanger. And I wanted to just demonstrate to the assistant what I call surgical semaphore. So if I have tied a knot and put it down, if I hold one up, that usually means I want one cut. So as the assistant, you bring your scissors in, you open up no further than necessary to do the job. And if I say one centimeter long out, but shorter, one centimeter, you cut and redraw. I do not want to see your scissors swooping in, wide angle and swooping out of the field. So if I'm holding up one, it's probably one needs to be cut. If I'm holding up two, then it is very likely I'm wanting both cut. But what I'd say to you is, if in doubt, don't cut at all. So I'm holding two up, and that's my signal, semaphore signal, to my assistant to cut both. And that, for somebody who doesn't do surgery, doesn't want to do surgery, is a very well controlled, excellent introduction of scissors into the operative field and withdrawal without hesitation and without any difficulty. So the last thing in the skills, and this is somewhat a little bit more difficult, is around hemostats. Now, as hemostats are put on vessels, and you need to tie them off, and it's the job of the assistant to hold the hemostat up. There you go, I'll hold that up. So you hold it in the air such that the surgeon can get the suture around. Then you lift the tip of the hemostat up so I can see that I'm completely round. And you turn it away so that I can see it bending down. So there are three movements in there. It's lift up straight, tilt and turn to enable me to do that. Alistair, you almost did that as well as demonstrating how to put a seatbelt on in an aeroplane. Okay, so lift up, lift, tilt, turn. There you go. And if I put it on the left hand, this becomes a little bit more awkward. I'm going to hold that up. You lift it in the air. Tilt it, so the point is up. 
turn it away and now undo it. And practicing undoing with the left hand is something excellent. It's something that you need to practice. And if it's a non-dominant hand, simply hold the hemostat in your fingers and literally disengage the ratchet. So there it is, and I disengage the racket, I can open up and close. And that is a, an action that is worthwhile you practicing as an assistant. Because you'll be asked to take hemostats on, off and on with both hands. So lift it up, separate from that hand. This hand, is it, your dominant hand is easier because you can probably put your fingers through. So there you have it. I hope that I've given you an outline of the principles of how to assist. I do recall working with Stephen Westerby who made some of the best move films for aortic root replacements and the camera was overhand. And in no certain terms, if your hand went into the operative field, you would get a reprimand on your knuckles with a tubing clamp because it had ruined the film. But the principle was there. Your hands are out with the surgical field. And as Jim Monroe taught me when I did my first cardiac assistant operation, it's a lateral hold and not a pull. So I hope I've explained to you that assisting is not a mindless stand there thinking of what you're going to do on Friday at the end of the week and planning your social activity. If you really want to get something out of assisting, it is worthwhile thinking to yourself, what am I going to look and learn in the operation? Read up a little bit of anatomy beforehand. Have some questions, because the most powerful thing you can do is tell me why. Assisting, if you stick to the rules that we have outlined, I can promise you, your surgeon will be delighted. And for little instruction, I'd like to thank Alistair, he has moved around the operative field this evening and made things very easy. Thank you very much indeed for your attention. Look forward to seeing you next week as we continue our IOM series and talk about ligation. Yes, not time. I hope you're well. Please be safe and thank you for joining the Black Belt Academy. Alistair, thank you. And do join me in congratulating him on his third down. That is quite something. Thank you. Well done, Al. Let's take the doctor's off. I've been walking around with a needle underneath my foot. Look. Oh, golly. Yeah, sorry. Okay, that could be potentially bad. <laughs> <laughs> okay. That, yeah. Look. Is there another one there? Yeah, make that two needles. Oh, golly. Make, yeah. that, make that two needles. Oh, golly, that's bad news. Okay. That could be bad news. <laughs> yeah. Okay, remember next time you need to actually... You need to actually, this is your operating theatre. Yes. <laughs> I'm standing right on that foot. Oh, thank God you didn't damage that. Could have been an ouch. <laughs> that could have been an ouch. That could have been an ouch and I swear. Oh, that was brilliant. You did very, very well. I was trying not to sneeze. No, you did very, very well.